Good evening, everyone. I, M.S. Devashri, a first-year student of DME Media School, feels honored to welcome you all on behalf of Media School of Delhi Metropolitan Education to the last session of the eighth day of the second edition of the world's first 10-day Digital Life International Conference, ICANN 2021. I would like to mention the highlights of previously successfully organized ICANNs. ICANN 1 was conducted on the theme India and changing aspects of news held in March 2018. ICANN 2 was all about Indian cinema and alternate networks that was conducted in November 2018. ICANN 3 with the theme issues of community agenda and news hashtag conference for change. And now we are here with ICANN 4 world's first 10 day digital live international conference. The theme for this year's conference is information, communication, and artificial networks. And the hashtag for the conference is communication redefined. ICAN4 is being organized by DME Media School in collaboration with the School of Communication and Creative Arts, Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia. We also proudly announced that ICAN4 is supported by Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR with our knowledge partners being KR Mangalam University, Gurugram Haryana, Adamas University, Kolkata, Makhila Chaturvedi National University of Journalism and Mass Communication, Bhopal, Vigyan Prasad Government of India. ICANN's academic partners include Guwahati University's Department of Communication and Journalism, as well as the Institute for International Journalism at Ohio University's E.W. Scripps School of Journalism. Also, ICANN 4's media partner is the Policy Times. Under the ICANN 4 flagship, there are certain highlights that I'd like our listeners to know. Like the participation of about 60 eminent scholars from five continents and 11 countries, namely India, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, Bangladesh, USA, Mexico, France, Italy, Australia, and Ghana. More than 100 media educators and researchers have gathered to present their papers in the conference. 36 live sessions are scheduled, including nine technical sessions, three workshops, seven panel discussions, three special sessions, and 10 masterclasses. And how wonderful is it that all the nine technical sessions are being chaired and co-chaired by women scholars representing different states of the country. At DME Media School, we have Spark, the Student Council of DME Media School that stands for students with positive attitude and resonating communication. Journalism at DME is the official newsletter of DME Media School. This fortnightly publication covers all the major activities happening in and out the campus. It is a student-centric newsletter carried out entirely by them under the supervision of faculty members. DME TV, the official YouTube channel of DME where you can find the playlist related to all the sessions, lecture series, film festival and conferences. It gives me immense pleasure to announce that we are now live on our official Facebook page. For more information, follow us on our social media handles and the links are being shared in the chat box. And now I'd like to welcome you all to this workshop on emerging technology in journalism. 360 degree virtual reality storytelling, practical and approachable with our guest, Dr. Aaron Atkins is a former newspaper journalist and an assistant professor of digital media at Weber State University, Ogden, Utah. He earned his master's degree in communication from Virginia Tech in 2016 and his PhD in mass communication from the prestigious E.W. Scripps School of Journalism at Ohio University in 2019. His research interests include journalism and message processing, audience perception and interaction with emerging technology and tech oriented media effects. He teaches courses in multimedia journalism, digital media production and 360 degree VR storytelling. Now I invite Professor Dr. Ambri Saxena, Dean DME Media School, Director DME Studios and Production, Director International Relations, Delhi Metropolitan Education, Noida to give us opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Devishri. Uh, welcome Dr. Aaron Atkins, 
uh so you are taking so much pains every morning you are getting you are getting up so early to meet us and to provide us all such contents which are really beneficial to us all uh, particularly the students are are sure to be benefited by whatever input you are providing yesterday's session was amazing it was very interesting as you uh, took everybody to this uh, uh, virtual reality experience so we believe that the kind of technologies that you are talking about which we can use in modern day journalism by having this 360 degree experience in virtual reality will definitely be the trend setter and this is something which we believe is the future in journalism so we are hoping that some more input we are getting today uh, which will be uh, used by the students in a big way thank you sir Thank you, sir. Now I'd like to call Dr. Aaron Atkins to take the session forward now from where sir left us yesterday after that enlightening session on virtual reality. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the introduction and um, just want to say it's been it's been an interesting couple of days. It is really early here and um, <laughs> it just let's see, I got here around 5 a.m. So it's good to set up. It was a whole thing. But um, after yesterday's session, we spent a lot of time talking about um, some of the, um, the conceptualizations of how to um, approach 360 degree video process um, um, production for um, journalism and documentary filmmaking and some of the um, foundational ideas that we have to uh, really think about in slightly different ways from television, from film, from other forms of digital media in terms of um, you know putting every putting a story together so today i'm going to focus the attention specifically on the actual production of um a 360 uh, virtual reality um video piece so there are a couple of pieces that i'm going to um i'm going to share them with you in short i'm not going to play the video just uh, so that way when this upload to when it uploads to youtube there will be no chance that um the youtube algorithm will see it as a copyright infringement in some fashion and they will you know negatively affect your session but I, what i will do is share my screen and um pause the videos in key places so that way i can kind of uh, demonstrate what i'm talking about in terms of production in terms of lighting in terms of blocking in terms of camera placements um audio production and so forth so um that way we will have a, a pretty good idea of what we're going without actually having the uh the algorithms that be uh, negatively affect your session uh it's it's um so yeah okay all right so the the examples i do want to share you with you are pieces that um i myself and my co-collaborators at ohio university um, and here at weber states have um, worked on over the last couple of years the first one is a piece that myself and Dr. Franklin Charles, um, he is um, an associate of mine from Ohio University who's now teaching at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania in USA. Um, he couldn't be with, it, with us this morning, uh, but we put this together as a documentary, a journalistic style documentary piece on old time music, which is a, a type of music that is specific to the Appalachian region in the United States. Um, and farmhouse sales and microbrews, which are also unique, not necessarily unique in that terms, but they came and grew out of the Appalachian region. And so we put, decided to put together a six minute, six minute documentary short, um, kind of marrying those two concepts in sort of an Appalachian tradition, traditional storytelling. Um, I mentioned it a little bit yesterday, but uh, today we will actually go over the specifics because that was one of the pieces that really kind of um, showcase some of the things that we learned as far as the production process went. And so I'll kind of walk you through step by step some of the things that we did that did not work out so well and some of the things that we did that worked very well and that we've used ever since moving forward. Because one of the really unique and interesting things about this, and I kind of touched this on this yesterday as well, but with this medium, because it is um, in every uh, it is emerging and technology in every instance of the word, the storytelling grammar that we use to put together these pieces are still being developed. And so a lot of what we were doing, we are learning through trial and error. And so this is going to be a really um, interesting representation of that instance of trial and error. The second piece I'll be showing you is a fictional piece. It's not a journalistic piece, 
Um, so we were not necessarily bound by journalistic ethics when we were producing it that my students put together um, in the spring. They finished it about two months ago. Um, it's about four and a half to five minutes long. And some of the techniques that we used in that piece are also practical uh, or usable in documentary storytelling uh, and so forth. But I want to kind of show you some of the steps that we learned in terms of um, how to approach different shot angles and different production styles. I have a few other pieces as well that I will use to demonstrate um, things like stitch lines, things like lighting and camera placement, and then using voiceovers to tell a story um, uh, and that sort of thing. Okay, so before we get and dive into that, I want to show you guys some of the, um, the, the cameras that my students were using this semester. So first off, I, I, I popped this out uh, the other day or yesterday, but this is an Insta360 uh, 1X2. It was recently released, and you can kind of see how it's um, uh, uh, it's glowing on the side. It indicates it's on, and you've got two um, 100, 220 degree uh, wide ultra wide angle lenses that are kind of married together to create that shot. Where along this line right here on the side of the camera, where this actually meets up that's where you will find what we call stitch lines where we actually sew the essentially sewing the shots together now the stitch lines are something that and every piece that we're going that i'm going to go over here in the next couple of um couple of minutes um that were something that we had to take into consideration and so um i just wanted to show you guys exactly how that happens and this camera is actually being being operated right now from my cell phone so I have this um, connected to this, and if you can see it, that's actually my uh, my computer right there. Uh, you can see, kind of see my my hand. If I turn it around, okay, I'll set this here. Um, you can kind of see that. There's my green screen. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so um, this is actually how we monitor the shots. So I have it linked to my cell phone, but uh, in um, other uh, contacts, we actually have it linked to um, iPads, larger monitors that were, that were feeding into computers. And so uh, we can actually kind of monitor what's going on from a distance. Okay, I'm getting a reading that my internet connection is unstable. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Okay, all right, cool. Okay, thank you. All right. So one of the other rigs that my students used was this one right here. Now, this one is a little bit more, this is just a tripod over here but it's kind of sitting on um, an arm here that it's actually supporting both the camera and the uh, ambisonic audio rig. Now, this is also an Insta360. This is a, uh, a 1R. And this down here is a Zoom H3 VR that captures ambisonic sound. Now, the difference between this and a standard stereo mic is that it, it captures audio in a sphere. So we have, um, there are four different microphones inside this housing that, uh, that, um, that are angled slightly differently. And so when we pull them into post-production, you will see four to six, depending on your settings, different tracks that all merge together. And then they actually line up with the sphere of, of the, the video sphere. And we can kind of um, sew them together as well. So that way, when you are inside a, um, an Oculus Quest or um, Samsung Gear VR headset, or even on your phone for that matter, um, the audio turns with your visual perspective. So the really important thing that I had to point out to my students over and over again is that it's really important that the front of your camera and the front of your microphone where the display is are facing the same direction. Um, so that way, when you actually get to the post-production side of things, that your audio and your video are uh, linked in that regard, because it is very, very challenging uh, in post, if your audio and your video are not lined up in the, this fashion to kind of uh, figure out what sound is coming from where and then rotate the sound to make it fit the video. It can be done. It's just really uh, challenging. Okay, um, so let me show this camera off real quick. So this camera, um, it, it was, it was a, it's a new model. It was released a couple of months back and I, I purchased it for, I think, right around $400. Um, this camera up here, the, uh, the H, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the Insta360 uh, modular camera 
This one I got for um, just around three and the Zoom Amazonic audio microphone, I think that was also about 250. And I, I received grant funding from the university to actually purchase things, things for my, specifically for my students. But um, they are pretty accessible considering a few years ago that they were um, much more expensive and much less practical. And the resolution on them wasn't nearly as good. Okay, so um, one of the I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys, and I'm going to um, talk about this uh, this music and microbrews um, uh, project for a minute. So initially, to start out with, this is part of a course that I I, um, I took as a PhD student at Ohio University under Eric Williams. Um, Eric Williams operates uh, what was uh, the grid lab, the gaming and immersive design lab at Ohio University, which has now uh, apparently gotten so large that it has expanded into its own. Um, I believe, I don't, I don't know how it was lined up exactly. It was either its own college or its own department within a different college. Um, but anyway, it's there was so much interest in the technology and the uh, the things that we're talking about today in terms of virtual reality and for journalism and for um, uh, film practice purposes and documentary purposes that it there were so many students that it had to expand. Um, and I, I was able to learn from him uh, for a couple of years, uh, which was, was was great for the on the production side of things. But um, so this was part, this was produced as a part of that class. Well, um, there are several, several people in the class that wanted to go with the film way. They, would, they wanted to produce art pieces, but I, my interest is in documentary filmmaking and journalism. So that was the approach we took. Now we didn't alter any of our images. Uh, we didn't add anything in that we weren't able to capture in real time because one of the things we were trying to do was follow journalistic um, standards and journalistic ethical practices as we were putting this together, which created a really interesting challenge for us. Because like I said, there was no standard for lighting. There was no standard for audio. There was no standard. You know, so we were trying to figure these things out as we went along. Um, so with that in mind, I'm, I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not, not going to play the video because of the aforementioned YouTube rights and whatnot. Um, so I will just uh, pause it and sort of walk you through what you're seeing on the screen and what you would have been hearing had we able to actually put this together. Okay. All right. So, um, old time music is, uh, it, it was rooted in Appalachian tradition and it evolved into um, the more commonly known bluegrass music in the United States. Um, it's very, it's via, it's fiddle heavy, it's uh, banjo heavy. Um, there are a lot of unique instruments. Um, and this is something that you would kind of see somebody up or a group of people playing on a front porch somewhere just relaxing and winding together and um i was always interested in this type of music but it, it's one of those, those things that are it's kind of passed down through oral tradition it's not necessarily studied in different types of music uh professions so we found a group of old-time musicians that regularly like to play together in athens ohio where uh, ohio university um, is located and we wanted to put together a piece on them. They happened to be playing uh, a jam sessions maybe once a week or you know once a month, uh, depending on how many of them were together um, at this, uh, this local microbrewery, which also was steeped in Appalachian tradition in terms that they were trying to produce farmhouse ales, which is something that you know, people in the, in the region used to, uh, to, to, to make on their own. So the opening shot here, you'll notice right away that um, you see two individuals here. Um, both of them are on banjo. And the setting itself is the brewery. You can see the, uh, the, 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 the barrels over here in the corner, the vats over here. We've got another banjo player here. We've got a gentleman on stand-up bass. Um, so um, yeah, I'll go ahead and let it play for just a second so you can kind of see it play out. So with the opening shot, the opening shot is um, there, there's no motion to the camera. And one of the things that we kind of talked about yesterday is every time you change a scene or, or go to fade to black or bring back up, your brain in the headset actually has to reorient itself. So one of the one of the things that we learned throughout this process is that each one of our shots are a lot longer than you would find in traditional film. 
and um, they aren't as they are they're not cut as quickly as you uh, you would see in traditional film, um, especially nowadays with modern filmmaking. So the shots are extended; they're a little bit longer, and you'll kind of see that as we move forward. But that is intentional because we shot this specifically for somebody in a headset, not necessarily on a computer screen. So um, one of the things I do want to point out is I, I look down, and you can kind of see our camera rig. Of course, you have the, the, the beverages that the, uh, the musicians were drinking, but this is our tripod. Um, you can, can see it like over here. Our audio equipment is actually right below it. It's being blocked out right over here. Um, but uh, the, this, this is, I want to mention this because we brought it up yesterday when, and when somebody asked a question about it. Uh, see this uh, white circle right here? These circles are where we are stashing our lights. So the scene itself was way too dark. These fluorescent lights did not do a good job of lighting the scene. Um, it's essentially a, um, a bar room or a brewery room. So we had to uh, place lights in different locations. So there's one of them. We have another one that's actually back here behind this gentleman. And our crew is actually standing behind, and myself, we're actually standing behind these vats. So I'm monitoring this scene as I'm shooting it um, with, my, uh, with, my, my, with my crew um, over here. So I'm going to move forward a little bit. And this is another take. Uh, we were actually, we're, we're hiding in the same location, but uh, this actually begins the interview with the owner of this place. His name is Sean and he is right here. So one of the things I do want to point out is the text I have here identifying him, of course, in, in, in television, this is a standard lower third, um, co-owner and master brewer. You know, so we had an interview with him. I actually had positioned the camera right here again you can look down to see our rig this is our this is a sennheiser ambisonic audio uh, microphone it, it's running directly into this four channel processor which in turn has a memory card storage on it so when we shot this you can't actually see the camera um because the angles of the lenses it is uh, it's actually uh negating or erasing the uh the, the monopod uh the stick which is really kind of useful but at the same time um, I, I wanted to make sure that we didn't edit out any of our equipment because that would or, and violate the, 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 the ethical standards that we set for ourselves when we were putting this together. But we did place this right here as if a uh, customer in the headset would be sitting at this bar with this individual having a conversation. So we didn't necessarily want to approach the camera as a character in this sense, but we wanted to approach the camera as um, an observer at a fly on the wall. Um, and as you can see, Sean White here is speaking directly into the camera. I'm going to let this play for a second, but um, the text right here, um, it is uh, actually looks pretty small, looks pretty standard on this screen, but in the headset, this is a, a mistake that we made going in. This text is giant. In order to actually read the words co-owner and master brewer in the headset itself, you have to do one of these. So um, perspective and perception of perspective is very important when considering how you're actually viewing these things. Because what you're seeing on the television screen or on the computer screen here is going to be very, very different from what your audience is actually going to see when they're uh, looking at this sort of, uh, in, 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 in headset. After a couple of years of planning and a lot of years of dreaming about uh, opening our own brewery, so Jimmy and I have known each other. Okay, so here, I, um, I, during the interview, I actually I, I allowed his voiceover to keep telling the story as we changed the shots. So this was just a shot that we, um, you can see it's dark outside. Um, this is actually in the Bureau Brewery. We are, the, the camera is placed right here on the edge of the bar. The gentleman was um, speaking from, actually from where the bartender is standing. And uh, we got this as a representation of just, you know, a, a day in the life of this particular establishment. <laughs> Sixth grade, actually. And the music from the opening shot where you had the musicians in the circle is still kind of playing, it's still playing in the background. You can still hear it. And that transitions when we go back to the musicians, they'll still be playing in that format. So it's a way that we're using the, uh, these visual images and the sound in particular to connect these different shots um, and still allow your audience to really kind of sink in to the experience. Sixth grade in East Elementary, um, down on the East Side back in We're kind of trying to... Uh... Now, one of the other things that I... Um, when I discuss is camera placement and um, shot composition. So with this, we were trying to get experiment with different locations for the cameras to get different perspectives and different types of shots. So here I actually placed the camera um, right underneath the taps. So you can see if you've ever been to a tap house, you have the, uh, the taps right here. 
um, for the, the the beverages. And this gentleman, this bartender right here, is actually about to pour into this glass, which I thought was a pretty synthesized a lot of effect. different ideas here. One is basically you guys, when you're in, when you're inside the headset, you're looking up, and of course he's a giant. He is you know standing way way above you, and uh, it's just a really unique. Um, shot for this. And then again here, as they're going through the process. We brew farmhouse ales with local ingredients and that kind of um, relates back. So with this particular shot, uh, again, the crew is actually standing behind this, uh, these vats. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, in order to really kind of, because with these shots, they do take a long time and it's really difficult to edit things moving forward. So one of the things that we try to do with this splice right here. With local ingredients and that kind of. It's just, a, we, we left the camera exactly where it was and we just did a quick fade from one shot into the other. So that way, you know, the, the person, the audience wouldn't have to reorient themselves inside the headset when they, uh, when they were moving forward with it. Um, relates for the use of. Uh, so power. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna find one more shot that I wanna. That that is actually pretty. Um, I thought it was amusing. But uh, this one right here. So um, when we debuted this this piece, we brought um, a whole series of headsets, uh, and, and not a whole series of headsets, but we brought people to the headsets to actually watch them. Um, go through this experience and when they got to this shot right here after sinking into the other um shots and then part of the, uh, the other elements of the story invariably every one of them actually with the headset on reached out and tried to grab onto something to hold onto. they were they physically tried to grab onto a table or to a wall or something because you're going from standing on the ground you know at a, at a fairly normal height to in the headset standing roughly 30 feet in the air. So as you're looking down, you're no longer on the ground. The, the distance is actually a lot more um, elevated. Again, this is a perspective thing with the 2D versus the 3D or the 360 um, headset. But um, people, because they were part of the experience, they had lost con contact with the real world around them. They got to this shot and then felt like they were going to fall. Which, from a media, which from a media effects perspective, is actually pretty fascinating. That that would actually register in their brains as something that they would need to um, reach out and grab onto something because of the danger element that they were perceiving. Uh, but uh, that, we thought this would be an interesting. Okay, so I'm going to stop my screen share right here for a second, and then hit on a couple of things that we also noticed. So, um, from the, from from a uh, director standpoint, uh, it's not only about camera placement and videography and cinematography. It's about even from a journalism perspective, um, blocking. So, the closer you are to this camera lens, the bigger you are going to appear in the headset. So if you were trying to get a close up of an individual with a standard film camera, you could you know, reasonably place the camera two or three feet in front of their face and then zoom in on the, the, the objects or the, the items that you wanted to feature in, in your shot, in your screen. With these cameras, not only um, you don't have the ability to do that kind of zoom, but the closer you get to an individual, the larger the, the, have this, their size um, changes exponentially. So for example, if I were to put this camera, um, let's say three feet away, away from my interview subject and have them speak directly into the camera, like Sean that you saw earlier when he was standing behind his bar. In the headset, Sean is going to appear six inches in front of your nose. And it is jarring. So we made that mistake early on. We thought that we, we approached it like we would a, a traditional film camera. So our interview subjects were, were you know, really reasonably close to, um, the camera and so when we when when we looked at it on the computer screen it looked just fine but when we actually looked at it in the headsets um, our interview subjects were invading the personal space of our audience members and that was a serious problem so we ended up having to go back and then reshoot a couple of these interviews um, or at least take another crack at it and adjust our cameras accordingly so the best camera position that i can offer the advice on camera positioning with human subjects that i can offer you um, is so situate your cameras between four and six feet away from your subject. So if you're closer than that, uh, the, the subject appears too large 
unless of course that's what you're going for for cinematic value but if you're just trying to go for a for a realistic conversation um, between four and six feet is probably where i would shoot for that beyond that the subjects actually just get too small just like when you're getting too close to the camera the the they they appear much larger when you get further away they appear much much smaller so perspective in the headset is everything and we have to take that in, into context when we actually go out and shoot any sequence lighting uh, was also an issue and i i showed you guys before one of some of the clever ways so we tried to integrate our lights into the sets themselves. So natural lighting, if you can get it outside, is the best lighting you can get for these types of cameras. Um, inside, uh, it's a little bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult, but being able to integrate or stash your lights somewhere where they're not going to be problematic or take your audience out of the scene. You know, if, you, if the audience um, sees them and doesn't realize what they are, that's fine. You know, no, no, no problem. They're not actually taking them out of the experience. Um, you're not trying to hide them. You're not editing them out in post you're putting them in places to where they're not going to be problematic. Okay, so um, one of the things you can also do in post-production with the text that I had, uh, I, the lower thread that I had identifying Sean, is not only can you actually, you know, make it smaller to where it appears normal sized in the, in the headset, you can actually curve the text in, um, in Premiere to where it actually follows the curve of the, uh, the shot so that way it's not out of place. And it doesn't look out of place and it actually melds well or much better with the actual scene itself. Okay, so I'm going to go back to um, the music and brews and uh, show you another part of it in terms of um, interview subjects. Okay. All right, so this is another shot that we came up with in the same room. We were trying to uh, vary our locations to give you a, a much more holistic sale. And, and uh, the um, interviews and music, music are still playing behind. has Appalachian roots. It's sort of a pre uh, bluegrassy. Uh, so with these transitions, we approach this more uh, from an editing perspective, more like you would see in live theater. So we were. Um, for those of you who have ever been part of a theatrical production, a stage production, uh, oftentimes, whenever you know, well, whenever it's time to change a scene, you can you can do a couple of different things. One thing is, of course, you turn off all the lights in the house on stage. Everything goes to black. Your crews come out and they move certain pieces around, bring in additional set pieces, and then you know they they leave. And then of course the lighting comes back on, and you are at a different location. It allows the audience, uh, it allows the crews the time to go in there and manipulate the sets without really being seen. And it allows the audience time to orient themselves in the new scene. So what we what we did, we decided to do is take that approach to when we change scenes. So you would see a slow fade to black and then a slow fade back up that allows your audience to know that you are, in fact, changing locations. They it allows their brains to you know hit that trigger point. OK, I'm going to appear somewhere else and uh, allows them to slowly sink in, sink back into the experience. Um, without being uh, having, without facing jarring quick cuts that you would see in um, in film or television. A pre so just right right grassy um, fiddle and guitar. Again, this is one of our lights back here uh, with a diffuser in front of it that kind of blends into the background. So this is another section. Um, this this person right here, she owns a local restaurant. Um, this is actually her restaurant in Athens, Ohio. So she was one of the banjo players. And so I was trying to figure out a way to interview her one on one to have her appear in a standard interview format um, in a visually interesting place. Um, of course, the lighting on the outside of the window is a little overblown, but her restaurant was very colorful. So we decided that was a good place to go about doing it. I am actually conducting this interview with her from behind this column. So that's actually my pant leg that managed to stay in the shot. Of course, if you weren't looking for it, you would never actually know it was there, but we were able to, I was close enough to her to where I could have um, a conversation with her and she was able to respond to it um, without having to shout and uh, without having to um, edit myself out. And again, here's our rig. The ambisonic microphone is stationed directly in front of her so she can actually speak into it. Um, and the crew is actually standing behind this wall right here. So these are the ways that we're trying to, uh, like throughout this production, um, have your standard crew on set, um, able to operate the machinery remotely using um, the computer or the, or the iPad or the connection that we have to operate the cameras and the microphones, 
um, in real time. End of the, by the time we stop playing. So we kinda, you're, yeah, see, that's her right there. The general into an kind of fade back as local into her. Um, and you know, that's one of the things that drew me to old time music was. So I don't know if this will work for you guys on Zoom, but as I'm changing the perspective, I can audibly hear the audio um, raising and lowering with the direction of the. Uh, um, the sense of place and so yeah it's nice to have it at little fish when yeah, you can get it a little bit so i don't, I don't know if it, if it came across all, over zoom at all but that's that's the um the ambisonic audio effect so as we are changing our visual perspective the audio perspective is changing with it so as as i move over this way i can actually hear her back over my um well essentially if i were in the camera or in the headset back over my left shoulder um, so that's where the um, that's where the ambisonics come in, and that happens uh, as a part of the rig itself, and you can just kind of change the direction in in Premiere in post. Okay, so I, I pulled up the chat window just now. Um, yeah, to do to do. Okay, questions. All right, yeah, all right. Well, don't worry about that. So let me stop this really quick. Okay, so one of the things I do want to point out to you guys. Um, is stitch lines. Now I talked about that before, but, and what we do is we try to come up with ways to hide them or mask them or mirror them in some fashion. Now, this was something that I shot at a baseball game in Athens. I'm not, I'm not sharing my screen. Let me get back to that real quick. Okay. So this is a um, actually we go out of our way every single time we use these cameras to um, minimize the effects of the stitch lines. So we try to line them up with um, either visual lines in the scenes themselves um, or actually block our actors. If, if we're not doing a journalistic piece and we're doing a fictional piece, we try to block our actors around the stitch lines so they actually don't cross through them. So if you can see this right here, um, this is the tripod that's actually that, that is supposed to be a circle. And as you can see, it's more of an oval. So what's happening is directly below the camera, um, where the lenses overlap, you are losing a little bit of the visual perspective. Now, the further out you go from the camera, the less pronounced those lines are. But you can kind of see right here, um, there's a little bit of overlap here. And right here with this bin, you can see the line, the wall of the bin um, is actually kind of disappears and it jumps back over here a little bit. That's where the stitch line disconnect comes in. Now, if you had a um, here, it's, it's you don't really notice it unless I kind of point it out to you or unless you're looking for it. But if you have a human subject walk through that line, they will disappear for a second and then reappear on the other side of that. So it's really important to be conscious of where you are, where if you're in a journalistic context, where you place the camera and how you place it or in a fictional or a film context, how you block your characters as they're walking through it. In the previous example with the music and brews, every single time I had a, a human subject moving in, a, um, in an environment, I had them be, I, I informed them of the lines and tried to steer them around it. Or when I set it up for an interview, I had my subject um, along a straight line, and the, the line of the bar was the where I had the stitch lines in the, in the previous one. The, the interview subject was in front of me. Um, the characters were all around me. And I, I, I made sure, even when the, the musician circle, to have my stitch lines off from one of their bodies. So in between two people, I would have it on one side and the other. So that way their bodies weren't affected by the, uh, the stitch lining or the stitching. Um, you can kind of see it a little bit in this trophy right here. It kind of blurs out a little bit. The further out you go, it doesn't matter because these people are going to be walking through. And it's not a problem. All right. But on this side, right there, you can see this gentleman reaching over it. His hand disappears right here. That was very quick. Let me actually bring that back for a second. So pay, um, pay close attention to this arm right here. And as he draws it back into himself, you will see part of his arm disappear. And that's what happens when a human subject crosses the stitch line. Can I see there where half of his, a uh, little chunk of his hand is actually disappearing? All right. So as I, when I tell my, when I talk to my students about this, I tell them that it's like dropping a pencil in a glass of water. 
once you hit that line, there's a little bit, there's going to be a little bit of a disconnect, a little bit of a jump. And so being cognizant, cognizant of that is really going to help your um, finished product um, work out uh, much closer. Because you can see it again in his shirt, there's a little bit of a disconnect between his actual shirt line and the stitched shirt line. And so um, this is actually, a, I was shooting this for a local um, Major League Baseball affiliated uh, summer league team in Athens, Ohio. So I was trying to come up with interesting visual angles or camera placements to put this. So right now, this is actually, um, you're standing right behind the batting cage net during practice. And I'm not going to play that because um, there is some music in there and uh, they were just, it's in the background, but Again, different fades. So there's one shot I want to uh, point to if I can get to it. This one right here. Um, so this gentleman, he is standing about um, three or four feet away from the camera. Now, he, in the headset, he's actually entirely too close. If you, um, if you watch this inside the Oculus, you are nose to nose with this guy, and it becomes distract distracting. So his head is right here. You can see kind of his nose is disappearing for the, because the stitch line runs right about here. But yeah, it becomes a little bit of a problem because he is so close to the image. Okay, so that's some of the differences between um, um, camera position, camera angling, and the difference between watching it on a, uh, a screen as opposed to watching it inside the headset. So another thing that um, I kind of want to mention with this is that sometimes if you integrate camera motion, um, into your experience, people can feel susceptible, they can be susceptible to motion sickness. And that's not something you really want with it. So one of the, um, the earliest examples of um, uses of 360 cameras, people were taking them on amusement parks. They would go to uh, Six Flags, they would go to Disneyland, and they would place cameras on roller coasters. Um, which is, you know, they just wanted to see what what would happen you know, to make the, you know, to create the illusion of a roller coaster ride inside of a, a headset. And what was happening was people were actually starting to feel motion sickness as a result. Um, so their brains are telling them they're in motion, but their bodies are not actually in motion. So that disconnect um, can create a queasy feeling in your stomach. Now, I only had experience with this once. I was conducting a, a research experiment at Virginia Tech. And I used a journalistic piece that was shot um, in um, Fallujah, actually, in, in, in Iraq. And there was a camera that was actually mounted in the front of a, um, inside a vehicle. And the shot lasted for about a minute. And during that minute, where um, our subjects, our audiences were, were seated and they were in motion in the headset, they started, they started reporting that they were feeling sick and they had to stop the experience. Um, one of them actually uh, had to take it off and then, you know, um, actually got sick as a result. So integrating motion, if you are going to do it, make sure you do it very slowly and very carefully and use it sparingly. Um, because as people are in these headsets, they, they can have a visceral reaction to that motion, which is why in the pieces that I showed you guys, we weren't actually using camera movement. We were had them all stationary. We had them all static. To, so that wouldn't be a factor. Um, but we did run into the, 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 the camera placement factor of the, the, the shot where we actually got above the ground that people were reaching out and trying to grab onto things to hold themselves up on um, because they felt they were falling. It's the same concept, except that motion generates that little bit of a queasiness. Um, and it usually only happens if somebody is already susceptible to motion sickness. So it won't like I'm not susceptible to that. So it wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't affect me. It never has. However, somebody who already gets car sick or train sick or air sick may feel something along those lines whenever they're inside these headsets. Um, another thing I want to um, point out uh, with the documentaries that we shot. I mean, this is something we mentioned yesterday, the concept of um, social presence where you lose track of the world around you in favor of the, uh, the mediated world and the characters that you see, whether they're animated, whether they're avatars or whether they are human subjects like the ones that we saw in the, the, in the, uh, the pieces that I just showed you. Um, if you are feeling that, uh, that the element of social presence, you will have some, some sort of a parasocial interaction with them. Um, after a while, if you're in there long enough, you, know, you no longer see them as illusion, like characters inside a, a, um, a film. You're actually 
moving inside your experience. Um, like as an example, whenever um, the shots that we had, we realized they were way too close. When somebody would get to that and turn around, they would see somebody's face right there in the camera and they would actually visibly jump back because those people, they're, they're, because those people were um, feeling like the characters in the film were invading their personal space. And so they were actually having a uh, physical reaction to the characters that were depicted. Um, which I thought was a fascinating media effects study uh, that, were, um, <laughs> that I intend to look into. But at the same time, as you're producing content, it's really important that you uh, take these things into um, um, perspective. The last thing I want to mention that, uh, as far as music and micro Bruce goes is that as people were going through this five and six minute experience, they were losing track of time which I thought was another fascinating thing. And within, with the New York Times Daily 360 that we looked at yesterday, all of their videos are between, let's say, two and five minutes long. And so um, when you're actually, when you're watching on a computer, there's, you know, you, you don't lose track of the world around you. But when you're in the headset and you're sinking into experience, a well-crafted experience, you sort of lose track of how long you're actually in the headset. So I had a colleague of mine, I was, um, I, I wanted to kind of test this um, a few weeks back. I had her in the headset and she was watching the Traveling Wild Black story, which were, um, that we talked about yesterday that read about 18 minutes long. And as she was um, going through the experience, uh, I asked her when she took the headset off exactly how long she thought she was in the headset. She reported she thought she was in there between six and eight minutes, but really it was closer to 20. Now, the same thing happened whenever I was uh, showing people the music and micro boost had thing. They thought that they were in there for about, uh, let's say, two minutes, and they were really in there for five or six. And so when, they're, when, you, when you're sinking into an experience, you are losing track of the world around you, including your perception of time. So if you have a really long experience, it, it may feel like they're in there forever, or it may feel like they're there for a very, very short amount of time. So how you construct your story should, you know, at least take into consideration the fact that your audience is not going to perceive time the same way that you um, are constructing it, which I think is also um, pretty fascinating. All right, so I'm gonna pause for just a minute before I shift gears into um, a, a fictional piece that my students put together and talk about some of the ways that they came around the, uh, um, some of the issues that we came up with, uh, that we came across in the music and bruise. Um, so are there, are there any questions in the chat so far that we can kind of pop up and address or can we just keep uh, moving, whoever's moderating? Um, sir, uh, there is no question so far. Uh, okay. So in that case, we can keep moving. And then okay. I'm sure that we'll be having questions towards the end of the session <laughs> because, you know, it's all visually like very mesmerizing, like I said yesterday. So yeah. you know, we're deeply immersed oh. into that right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I really, I honestly wish if, uh, if we were in person, I would have brought some headsets with me and allowed you guys to actually see this stuff firsthand as it's meant to be seen. Um, because it makes a huge difference in how we're actually seeing things. So when you're seeing it on the computer screen, it's a little pixelated, it looks a little rough, but inside the headsets themselves, it's much cleaner and it's much more immersive um, as far as uh, the, the, the visual environments go. Um, but okay, so we'll dive right back into the fictional piece. So my students, I taught a, a special topics course this past semester at Weber State University for a small number of students in our digital media department. Um, the purpose of this was to just explore the technology because it is so new and the storytelling um, structure are, are, are so, um, are still evolving and still emerging, still coming out, still being tried. Um, I wanted them to kind of um, experiment with, with, with different um, storytelling mechanisms. And so ultimately at the end of the course, they had to put together one long semester project that they worked on for a month as their you know, final exam for the, for, for the course. So they decided to construct a fictional um, crime story. It ran about five minutes long and um, there are only two scenes per se, or two sequences with multiple scenes. But the way they actually came up with to get around the stitch lines, to work with um, the camera as a, um, the camera inside a fictional uh, reality, they decided to address the camera as a character itself, uh, which was a really, I thought was a very, very interesting way to go about doing it. And so not only did they address the camera as a person inside the experience, um, we constructed a body to serve as the tripod for the camera itself. 
So that way, let's see, one of, one of the reasons that they wanted to do this is we looked at a lot of different 360 videos um, inside the headset to get that had first person or camera perspectives that were, you know, um, as, as their uh, as the design mechanism. Um, but every single time they would look down and they would see a tripod, they would look down and they would see nothing like they're floating in air because the, the, the tripod of the camera rig was edited out, which is fine. But what was what it was doing was kind of taking them out of that experience. So instead of using a tripod, they decided to use um, to build a body and have that body serve as the tripod itself. So the camera position, we actually built um, a cardboard piece that ran along the shoulders inside a jacket. And we use that to mount our camera. So when you're inside the headset and you're looking down, you're actually seeing a body. So it helps create the illusion that you are there. You're actually part of the character. Um, so this has also not been published on YouTube. So what I will do is we'll, we'll play this because there's no copyrighted material in it. Um, so that way um, we'll be fine with that. But the, the first, the opening scene, um, it takes place on a cliff um, here in Utah um, along a reservoir. And so the, the crime that takes place is uh, there's a bit of a lover's quarrel and one accidentally pushes the other over the side of the cliff. So in the headsets, when you're attached to this corporal body, you and the camera are both falling over the side to create the illusion that you are part of this. You're actually, remember what I talked about earlier with motion sickness? You feel that treading in your stomach as you're falling over backward. Um, it's, it's a really interesting effect that I didn't quite, um, I didn't know how it was gonna work out, but it worked out pretty well, actually. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen and pop this one up. Uh, okay. So this was also edited in edited in Adobe Premiere. Um, this uh, this text right here was actually dropped in using After Effects, and you can see our primary character um, in a second walk right through it. So that's just some, a little effect that they decided they wanted to put in there. So this. Um, is the, the the jacket of our tripod. This is the reservoir lake where we shot it. And you can kind of see the distance perspective. So we, we are very much on the edge of this environment here and there is a significant drop right here. So if you look down, it would be like, if you were sitting, if I'm looking down right now um, at, my, at, my, at my jacket, this perspective is what I'm seeing. And that was a unique element um, and to this. And this right here um, is actually our director shot a plate of his neckline and then superimposed it um, over the, the, the cardboard cutout that we used as a camera tripod. So this is just a standard editing technique um, that we used uh, that they put a plate on there. So when you actually turned around and looked down, you would actually see something besides our tripod. So I'm gonna go here and just kind of hit this play button. So it changes colors, she approaches. Now right here, you can kind of see that, you know, she looks very, very small in this image, but she is really maybe 10 feet away. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of the depth and the illusion of uh, the differences in perspective when you're shooting with these types of cameras. Now, when she walks closer, So this is what it's come to. I cannot believe that you were blackmailing. Okay. So she is standing right now about four feet away from the camera. In the headset, um, it would be like if you were standing, if, if you were sitting right in front of somebody and having a conversation with them, this is the distance that you want to do because it, it is inside your personal sphere, but it's not too close. Me, I with. You know what this could do to me? You know what? You know what? Actually, no, give me that phone. Give me that phone. So right now you are in the middle of this fall. Uh, we had arms here that would they were loose that would actually flail out when pushed. The shot only lasts a couple of seconds, but it's enough. And so when they when when it goes to black, when it hits, that would indicate a um, a scene change. Now, this part of the perspective, uh, uh, I've got it upside down now. Uh, so let me correct myself. Okay. So this right here, 
this is the stitch line that we had in the camera. Now, the way that they came up to uh, they came up with uh, to to get around these stitch lines is they shot they shot this uh, this scene at two separate times of day, and they actually had the story come out in two different fashions. So the way they wanted it to play out was that on one side, on this side over here, where you see this woman looking at you. Um, the crime scene is actually being investigated. So you will see her, you will see a police officer, you will see an investigator um, in, the, in, the, in this hemisphere, like right back here, he approaches. And in this side, which happens at a different time of day, you will see our um, primary um, antagonist here, our, 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 um, our perpetrator, trying to stage the crime scene. So in the on in the in the right side of the hemisphere, you've got the the crime scene being staged. In the left side of the hemisphere, you have the crime scene being investigated. Now the action and the dialogue stagger; they don't take place at the same time. They don't overlap. So you have something happening on the left and something happening on the right, and they intertwine together as a result. You, um, as the uh, the victim in the headset, are looking down again at your your body. You're kind of splayed out here after your fall. And so you're seeing this from your perspective, um, from, from the perspective of the victim. So you're kind of watching this kind of play out, but this is where the camera placement comes in. And this is how they got around the stitch line. So they, they didn't try to eliminate it. They didn't try to block around it. They used it to separate the hemispheres of their two shots. They shot at two different times a day. So by making it more apparent and more stark, they got around, they, worked, they blocked themselves around the issue, around the problem. Hey, are you the one that called this in? Is this how you found him? Yeah, I was, I was just jogging and I saw him down here and falling. And... So for the next few minutes, as, 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 as a part of this sequence, you will see um, this person here is staging the crime and this, these people over here kind of going through the process of investigating it. Now, I can't show you any more with this because they are kind of submitting it to a festival here in Embed. But um, this is one of the, um, the way they, they came up with the idea to, there's the top of the cliff up there, to kind of uh, use these hemispheres to help direct the scene, as opposed to trying to fight against the hemispheres and the stitch lines, uh, was a really unique way to come up with doing that. So each one of those actors, as far as audio is concerned, the uh, the ambisonic mic that I showed you guys earlier was stationed to, directly beside or underneath the, the camera positioning. So we can capture that our ambisonic sound. Um, however, each one of those actors also had a lavalier mic um, attached to their, their, their clothing. So that way, when in post-production, we were able to bring in the lavalier mic and then uh, separate them out and have good uh, vocal audio at the same time. The challenge comes in with pairing stereo audio with um, ambisonic audio because they're two completely different mechanisms. But in Premiere, you can adjust your, uh, it was, that was another reason they wanted to do the hemispheres so they can adjust their audio accordingly. So we took everything, uh, all the audio that from the characters in the right side of the screen and channeled them to where you could only hear them in the right side of the uh, Right, the, the right hemisphere, the right, the right ear. And the same with the left side. So that way, even now, as you're as you're in the first person position and you're looking straight ahead, or you're um, being the body character in that sequence, your audio is to the left and right, and it mirrors your visual perspective. Everything else is still turning in the hemisphere if you were uh, to kind of go around that. But because they they positioned, uh, they blocked their uh, the character right in front of that backdrop of the cliff. There's no reason to really kind of look behind you. So in that regard, they used um, blocking and direction to eliminate some of the uncertainties around the audience perspectives that we mentioned yesterday in terms of audience control. Now, for instance, there's no real way to guarantee your audience is going to look where you want them to look at any given time. But using careful direction and audio cues um, and the set and the environment against that backdrop as a way to eliminate some of the um, unnecessary areas inside the, um, the hemisphere, um, it was a way to actually kind of, you know, um, eliminate some of those uncertainties. 
So that's um, kind of how they were able to do that. They were there. They submitted that. Um, that's the reason I can't show you the whole thing. They submitted that to a film festival that's being juried um, in August. So we're we're waiting to, to, to go through that process as well. Um, but really, to kind of close things out, stitch lines are things you need to be absolutely um, aware of in every context: journalistic context, film context. Audio is something you need to be acutely aware of. Lighting, blocking, um, using distance perspectives, um, invasion of personal space, or you know, having things at a distance to where they're further away to give it a more naturalistic feel. The disconnect between what you're seeing you know, when you're editing or when you're shooting or when you're seeing on your, your computer screen versus what you're seeing in a head-mounted display, being conscious of the um, the HMD as opposed to being conscious of what you're seeing on your um, video screen, because they will have an effect on your audience. Now, um, the, the last thing I really want to throw at you guys is that um, a lot of these things that we're talking about today are very practical, it's con practical considerations for all different types of shooting with this technology. Um, make sure your cameras are, you know, position them in a unique and visual, visually interesting environments with stuff uh, that use the entire, either they use the entire sphere or eliminate the unnecessary sides of things. So you can do this through blocking or through editing. And what really kind of excites me about this technology, and one of the reasons that I feel like it's a huge opportunity for both journalists and filmmakers, especially at the student level, is that the storytelling language, the grammar of which we're trying to put together through editing, through direction, through conceptualization, through um, experimenting with different types of um, uh, camera positionings and storytelling mechanisms is still being developed. So over the next few years, um, as we try different things and fail or try different things and succeed, uh, we're going to be able to help develop that storytelling grammar as we move forward. And so this is a really unique opportunity for us to get a little weird with it, to experiment with it and see what works and what doesn't in different contexts. So that way, um, if it, it, in a few years, if it does become more normalized, we'll be a part of this process. And we'll be able to um, say, hey, you know, I, I, we figured these things out. Let's move forward with it and try something new, because as with with emerging technology, they do provide us with these opportunities to really kind of play around and see what happens. So if something doesn't work, great, you learn something. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, that's one of the things I try to tell my students um, when I teach this class again is that we are going to have the opportunity to you know work things out in really creative ways, or try to work through problems or is issues as we come kind of come through this. Um, okay, so that's that's really what I wanted to share with you guys today. I do see a question here. Let me go ahead and um, see how do you do the sound designing for 3CC? How do you set the metrics and sync it with the directional movements? Okay, all right, yeah. Um, so the question, uh, let me read this real quick. How do you do the sound designing for a 360 degree video? And how do you set the matrix and sync it with the directional movements in the headset? Okay, that's a very, very good question. So, um, that's done that's done exclusively through software now there are a couple of different ways um that it can be done now um the last couple of times that i did this using ambisonics i used uh, adobe premiere because when they updated it specifically to handle ambisonic audio you're able to tweak it and move different channels um i don't have an example set up here on my laptop that i can share with you right now but i can open this zoom ambisonics software to give you an, a visual idea of how the is done without using um, a, an, an audio file because I, I, don't, I don't have one on my laptop. But let me go ahead and share this real quick and I'll show you um, exactly how this is done. So this um, is a Zoom Ambisonics player. This um, is software that actually came when I purchased the microphone that was specifically designed to handle the directionality of um, ambisonic audio in a sphere. So if I were to bring a file in, actually there might be a file in here already. Yeah. Okay. So I have no idea where that sound came from, um, but it's apparently something that I, I did in the past. So up here at the top, we have stereo sound, which is, you know, just, um, which is default for my computer. So left side, right side. Um, when we actually switch into binaural, uh, or you can have 5.1 surround, you can see the arrows are actually changing in here. So binaural, you've got directionality, 5.1 surround, you've got, um, you know, that, that would mirror the microphones, custom left, right over here. So you can actually customize this as much as you want. But let's actually go with binaural right now. 
So um, when you import your sound, um, you remember how I said, uh, make sure your camera is facing, your audio uh, microphone is facing forward the same direction as your camera. So this is how it comes in. Um, when you pull in, pull, pull in an audio file, the front of your um, audio will actually mirror the direction you actually have the audio. So in order to play with it, you can actually just kind of click on the sphere or click on your uh, vertical and your pitch and your roll and tweak your sound accordingly. Now, right now I've just flipped it. So um, you can see my letters, my um, front F, R for right and L for left and uh, B for back. Um, I had them all upside down. So I've actually taken the sound and I've inverted it. So if I were to export it like this, using my export button here, when I pulled it into, into Premiere, the sound would actually, the soundscape would be upside down. So I'm actually gonna pull that back down to where I've got the back, front, right, left, and I can roll it. Or I can flip it on the horizontal axis, just like you would a spherical video. So right now um, I've got, the front is actually facing me, which would be the back. Um, so the front you would actually want facing that direction. So I'm going to roll that and then flip it on the horizontal axis to where the B for back is facing behind me. So this is essentially how you would operate this. So once you get it where you want it to be, like if you want it off axis or if you want it center axis or if you want it, um, let's adjust the pitch and roll to where we've got it, where we want it. So that would be, um, let's say at eye level, if that's the direction we want to start our video, which it will be, we would take this and put it like this and then we just hit export and it would export an Amazonic audio file. Then you take that file and you drag it into Premiere and with, with your 360 video and synchronize them to where you want them to be synchronized. And then when you export them, it'll actually export it in Ambisonics as long as you have um, your settings hit for Ambisonic. So I actually have a Premiere video file right here. Um, oh, I, it's not the file, but um, if you go into video effects, do, 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 do immersive video right here. This actually handles 360. So you've got VR Sharpen, you've got VR Rotate Sphere, you've got Glow, you've got Fractal Noise, you can do all kinds of fun stuff with this. And you can also, um, because it is a video file, you can add your standard video effects to it if you wanted to. Now on your export, in order to render something, I'm not sure if it'll allow me to export it without a file in there. Let's just try. Export media. Is it going to do it? It's not going to do it. Okay. Um, if, <laughs> I don't have a raw file to throw at you. Well, I might. Let me let's see what happens when I do this. Okay, yeah. All right, here we go. So, yeah, I can, you go to file. Um, you would go to export, export media. And you would get this you know, standard export box. Now, your VR settings are actually buried down here. So, I'm going to set this for H.265, which is a which is a it's, it's it's still a small compressed file, but it's better for the Oculus headsets than you know your H.264. So you would scroll down here. So you render at maximum depth, and all the way down here at the bottom, you would find this selection right here for VR video. Now this is always here in Premiere um, since the twenty I think twenty nineteen update. But um, and it'll automatically detect your video settings as a, a spherical VR video, uh, but you can change the settings as according. So right now um, I have it set for monoscoping. If you wanted to give it some depth, you can um, either render it as stereoscopic, one lens for one one video for each eye, um, over under or side by side. Now I shot this in mono, so if I render it in stereo, it's not going to look very good. Um, but and then you would go down here for audio. Same thing, scroll down, see audio quality, good, 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 good. Um, and then since I did not have, I, I, didn't, I don't have an Amazonic audio file to share with you guys, um, you would go down here to Amazonics and click audio as Amazonic. And that would also render the, um, the export in, in the, the, same, the same sphere as the, uh, the video sphere is. So that's how you would actually export that. I would um, use maximum render, maximum render quality, of course, and then set it how you want to. Um, on the export and that will show you that that'll actually allow you to um one with uh, the zoom amazonics player adjust your audio within the sphere and then to export it after you've married it to a video so i'm going to draw this over here into this file format 
And so when you're when you're editing in Premiere, like the the shot that I had where with the the bartender, we're kind of trying to. Um... So, um, you remember how when I when I when I showed you the example? I mean, the, the, it was huge. He was a giant, and you were looking up at the tap, and the the glass was massive. But when you're looking at it on a standard computer screen, on the editing screen, this is what you're seeing. So your stitch lines are in a sphere. You can see them here and here, but it's really just one line. So what Premiere does allow you to do is preview your sphere, preview your 360. And so um, you're gonna right click on it. You'll go down to VR video, you'll hit enable, and it will allow you to actually see how it would look inside a sphere. So that way, as you're editing, you can be cognizant of some of these, these things that we've talked about. Again, here's the backdrop, the stainless steel, our primary action is taking place right here. So this is our focal point and so forth. So this is what it's, this is what it's going to look like once it's exported. But it's, it's, sometimes it's easier to actually edit it or, or at least cut it together when it looks like this in a, in a flattened out pano, a panorama. OK, so there are, let me stop sharing here. I think there's a couple more questions here. OK. Beat cancellation and audio. That's not something I'm sure about. Um, I've started working with Amazonic Audio fairly frequent, uh, fairly recently, and I had um, a, an audio technician or a specialist that came in who talked to me about it a little bit. Um, beats cancellation is not something I'm familiar with, so I wish I could answer that question for you, but that's not something that I can really speak intelligently about, so I'm just not going to try. Um, but that is something that is actually... There, there are some questions that, uh, that have come directly to me, and there is one okay. question by one of our uh, faculty members, Sachin Nair, sir who says um, uh, with the digital um, uh, you know, uh, medium faltering to provide a satisfactory replacement to conventional teaching, can VR and AR be used uh, uh, as a you know, more effective alternative uh, to that? Can it be incorporated uh, in the teaching setup? Yes, um, give me about five seconds and I'll answer that question. I've got somebody at the door. I gotta make sure they don't come in. Okay. Well, yes. Um, can you can you ask that question one more time? Because uh, I, I have an answer for it, yeah. but I want to make sure that I, I, I said uh, uh, with digital medium faltering to provide a satisfactory replacement to the conventional teaching. Can VR and AR provide a better and effective uh, alternative to that? Can it be incorporated in the uh, you know academia in the teaching in the way teaching? Yeah, is <laughs> yeah, that's actually a very 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 good question. Um, my, my colleagues and I, um, here at Weber State and um, Franklin Charles that I mentioned before um, at Slippery Rock, who I work with at Ohio, um, we have um, people in the education and psychology department, as well as myself kind of taking the lead on this project. I can't talk too much about it because it is a research project that's in the works. And I don't want to talk too much about it before we actually get, get, get our legs under us. But with these cameras, they actually have the capacity to live stream. And there are digital platforms that allow us to live stream into headsets. Um, and there are also uh, um, digital based social applications, social apps inside the Oculus Quest headsets that allow us to interact in real time with each other for, you know, for, for social purposes. So why can't we use that for educational purposes? So over this past year, um, at least, um, after when the pandemic really kind of hit in uh, places in the United States started locking down universities, um, K through 12 education, uh, primary school education, they all went online kind of like this format that we have now. For better or worse. Now, there are some very, very effective teachers and very effective instructors who can use this medium and this method to, you know, really kind of um, get their lessons out there, get their points across. Um, I struggled with it personally. And so as I was going through this format, I, and because I'm working with some of this technology, I was starting thinking about, is it possible to get into um, using the live stream capacities for with using these cameras to um, use it in a classroom setting? Like, for example, I am in a um, TV studio right now inside the, the basement of the library. Um, at, my, at my university. Now, if I were to live stream with this 360 camera to my students who are in an Oculus headset, I could deliver an effective lesson that would allow them to kind of be in present in the classroom environment with, with, me, with me and with each other. 
Now, whether or not this modality would be more effective than Zoom, I can't say yet. Um, that's one of the things that we're trying to evaluate through research. Okay. So um, one last, there, there's one last question because okay. you know, majority of our uh, participants here are students. Now yeah. you've taken them from, uh, like they've taken a journey from the conceptual understanding of uh, what was told yesterday to a more technical uh, you know, understanding that has been delivered today. So now there are some students who would be keen to take this uh, subject further. They would be interested in getting into it. So how can they take a leap forward? I mean, uh, what are the sources available from where can they get to understand more about the grammar of this particular subject so that you know they can make up their mind either to go completely into this field or uh, probably you know they can just understand that you know this is not their cup of tea so yeah. for that they would need more information so from where can they get all that information okay so um there are actually uh, some of my colleagues at ohio and so, no, 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 i'm talking specifically about ohio because that's where i came from but there are some people around the world who are doing excellent work with this um because it is so new people are starting to write books about it they're starting to write textbooks and information packets about it. Now, um, Eric Williams, who I mentioned before, and some of our collaborators at Ohio put together and just recently published a, a textbook looking at using um, 360 virtual reality for cinematic purposes, for filmmaking, not necessarily from a journalistic perspective, but I, I know they recently published a textbook and I um, can actually pull up the name of it real quick um, so that way I can give you a place to start. Uh, okay, it's in the file, this file. So I will actually, um, this is um, Eric Williams' um, Vimeo channel, as well as his, um, his, an introductory to the textbook that he actually wrote specifically for some of the concepts that we're talking about today. And I will share my screen on this website and I'll also post the link um, in the file. Now, this is a good place to start. I've read through this. Um, some of the, um, he put it together, he wrote and he edited it with, uh, with a series of filmmakers and collaborators from Ohio University, um, each of which I personally have met and uh, have worked with in some fashion um, previously as a part of that initial class that we talked about. Um, so they are filmmakers that are doing good work with this medium. And this um, goes through some of the trial and error that they themselves have also used and some of the directing styles and techniques, camera, camera positioning and so forth. Um, so let me share that with you. And this textbook is available for purchase now. So if you guys did want to take a look at it or at least um, you know, evaluate it in some fashion, you, were, you should be able to do that. So CineVR, narrative tips, tips and techniques. So one of the things they did, um, and I think to play through some of these, you actually need a, um, well, I'm not sure, um, I, can, I can play through some of this. Um, so these are Jordan uh, Heron, uh, as an example, the graduate student um, who put this piece together, um, worked at the Grid Lab at Ohio University under Eric Williams. And this was his um, uh, graduate student project that he put together. And down here, we have a couple of different series that um, they have put together. Um, Destiny is a, um, a series that actually follows the same characters through of different experiences. Um, so we have a thrift store, um, prenatal class, uh, at a motel, isolation, homecoming, and so forth. Then they all showcase different directing styles, different editing styles that are also um, mentioned explicitly in this textbook. So as you're reading through this and watching these to accompany this, um, like for instance, that there's a concept in here about directing in a quad, instead of using two hemispheres, using four hemispheres. Um, one of these videos actually corresponds with that. So you can read through how that was actually done and then take a look at the, the accompanying piece and then get a feel for the visualization for it moving forward. So I will go ahead and pop this in there. Um, it's a really good source of information and it's a really good place to start. So let thank me... you very much, sir, for sharing, yes, sir. Uh, you know, this information. I think, you know, because that is something, um, uh, you know, the students would want to, you know, get to understand more because uh, it would have been otherwise very unfair to leave the students stranded <laughs> like this after so much of information oh, yeah. and so much of insight. Yeah. Given. <laughs> but thank you so, very yeah, no, much for that, sir. Not a problem. So a, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of what we did here, um, I, I taught I taught students an entire semester's worth of material, and so a lot of what I'm talking about here, we uh, I had a lot more time to expand about over the course of you know four months, 
Um, so <laughs> I know you guys are getting a very truncated version of that. And you know, for it, I don't want to leave you hanging in that regard. So absolutely. Um, I had one last question that popped up to me here. Can you suggest some less expensive gears for beginners? Yes, I'll do this. this is the last thing I'll say before I um, um, quiet out. Um, so about three to four years ago, um, Samsung produced cameras to go with Samsung phones. Um, there was, um, I think it was, uh, and, and the Gear VR headsets. I think it was just Samsung 360 or Samsung Gear 360 was the name of the camera. You can find those um, on Amazon or eBay now for about $30. So they're very, the, the quality is not nearly as good as what I showed you earlier today, and certainly not as good as the cinematic cameras, but it's just, uh, just as a place to get started, um, you, you can go to eBay or you can go to Amazon or you can find these cameras that people are selling that are very, 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 very affordable. Um, just as a way to get started, um, that's a good one. Yi 360, YI, um, YI 360, the, they made a camera along, uh, alongside the, um, the Gear VR camera that is also will probably run you now about $50. So if you're just looking for something to play around with or just to get you know, used to feeling how to shoot this stuff, those are very inexpensive ways to get started with it before you, you know, invest in something a little bit more um, weighty. Okay. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for uh, providing so much of information. I think uh, it is one of the most interesting sessions that we've had. Uh, this is something that was new to most of us. And um, I think uh, with this, uh, the students probably can think of something different when they are, when they are planning uh, you know, their careers in, in future and their you know, streams that they have to choose. In the future, I think you've given them some very, uh, you know, useful insights. With that, uh, I would request uh, Devishri to take the program forward to the formal um, ending of this session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to call Professor Dr. Susmita Bala, Head DME Media School, Delhi Metropolitan Education, to give the concluding remarks. Thank you, Devishri. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ellen Atkins. Today also we had a rich visual journey and amazing experience. Thank you for apprising us with the innovative use of technology in journalism. Thank you. Thanks to all the participants. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. I extend my heartiest gratitude to our guest, Dr. Aaron Atkins for this very much inspiring and informative session. I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor Dr. Amrish Saxena, Dean DME Media School, Convener ICANN 4, and Professor Dr. Susmita Bala, Head DME Media School, Chief Associate Convener for ICANN 4 for the ideation and planning of all the sessions. I would like to thank Dr. Manasvi Maheshwari, Mr. Pramod Kumar Pandey, Ms. Manmeet Kaur, Ms. Shruti VS, Mr. Mohit Kishor Vats, and Ms. Mudita Raj for their constant support and guidance. A heartfelt thanks to Mr. Ritik Ghosh, Mr. Sumantra Sarthi Das, Mr. Sachin Nair, and Mr. Yogesh Sharma for managing the overall digital operations in ICANN 4. I would like to thank our newsletter team comprising of both students and faculty members, namely Ms. Sukriti Arora and Dr. Tinam Bora for constantly supervising and mentoring everyone. And also, I thank Mr. Mohamed Kamil, Ms. Krishna Pandey for working around the clock in all the press proceedings. You can keep a check on our press proceedings on the official face Facebook page of ICANN. I'd also like to thank Mr. Anmol Mehta from our DME family and Mr. Sumohit Nirala for one of our knowledge partners, KR Mangalam University's end for tirelessly working and making our events look more beautiful digitally, so with the help of their prolific designs. I would also like to thank our entire team, all the faculty members and students who have worked day and night facing all the challenges and obstacles of the pandemic to make this conference happen. Lastly, I thank all our participants who joined this session and our audience for being here and contributing. Dear participants, I request you to please take out a minute and fill the feedback form through the link provided in the chat box. Your every feedback matters to us. I request everyone to follow our social media handles for more updates and information. And don't forget to visit the DME website and the ICANN for website for any or all updates. 
Here, we complete the eighth day of the second edition of World's First 10 Day Digital Life International Conference, ICANN 4. We are looking forward to two more days filled with knowledge, expertise, and deliberations on a diversity of topics. I would like to extend thank you to all the people who have uh, contributed, who've been putting in so much of effort. And with that, uh, we are waiting for tomorrow for another day with uh, some more knowledge, some more insights. Stay safe. Uh, stay healthy. Good night.